Hey folks, this is Josh Schlossberg with the Green Root Podcast. I'm really excited to speak with our next guest, Jeff Gibbs, writer and director of the documentary film Planet of the Humans. Executively produced by Michael Moore and released on YouTube on Earth Day, many folks consider Planet of the Humans to be the most important environmental documentary of the century, even all time. The film has garnered praise, controversy, and even an organized campaign of censorship, where opponents of the film removed it from YouTube for about 12 days after it had racked up 8.3 million views in just about a month. But it's now back up for the world to see. And on that note, I'd like to welcome Jeff Gibbs to the Green Root Podcast. Well, thanks, Josh. Really nice to be here and to uh, talk with you again. I don't think we've spoken since uh, we were in Vermont, other than a couple of emails now and then. Um, but, um, yeah, and that, thanks for, um, being part of the film. I mean, that was really, uh, an eye opener to me and, uh, what a difference it made to actually be somewhere, you know, on the ground, uh, experiencing it, you know, um, rather than just talking about it. So thank you for your contribution and it's an honor to be here. Absolutely. Yeah. I think we're living in really exciting times and uh, Planet of the Humans, I think is part of it and is really on the pulse of what's going on. So I guess just to start with that, did you think that Planet of the Humans would get that much positive attention, as in 8.3 million or probably more like 10 million or more with all the pirated versions of the film out there? Um, yeah, I, you know, it was hard to say what was going to happen because uh, what's happening now with the, with the, uh, uh, the kind of almost uh, violent <laughs> opposition, I mean, I say that because uh, you know, some of the name calling and the uh, inaccuracies and the basically lies about who we are and what the film says. But, um, you know, it was a mystery because during our test screenings, things were over the top. Um, you know, during our our uh, our world premiere, our, we officially premiered this this year, 2020, but our world premiere for um, a slightly different version um, was at the Traverse City Film Festival. And... Um, there were many films there, uh, you know, I don't know, there were maybe 100 films, and including uh, um, the uh, last Academy Award winning documentary. Um, and, you know, it was somebody said, it's almost like the Planet of the Humans Film Festival. I mean, people couldn't <laughs> stop talking about it. And we were sending uh, screeners to press and to various people to watch. And we, we developed this rule that th we wouldn't hear from them for two days, for, for, for two to three days because they were so shaken up by the film <laughs> that uh, it would take them a while to recover, and then they would call. And yet at the same time, I was submitting the film to Sundance, to Tribeca, um, to Cannes, to Mill Valley, to sh the Chicago Film Festival, to the Hamptons Film Festival, to the Woodstock Film Festival, to the Dubuque, um, you know, fifth grade, you know, and <laughs> there was crickets. I'm like, what the hell's going on? I've seen the audience reaction. I know they don't have another Toronto, um, uh, you know, just all of the usual. I'm like, and I wrote many of them and w was like, you know, uh, this film is going to create as much discussion as any other film, any film at your festival mm -hmm. and just nothing. And so I was quite kind of wondering, you know, is there something wrong with the film or is there something? Um, so we had a hunch that it was going to get a big you know, reaction, but also there was this countervailing message of like, um, huh, we don't like your film. We don't want to show it. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, no, I did, we never expected it to explode this fast. Um, and you know, I was hoping, oh, maybe we'll get a million or two views. Is that, is that too much to, to ask for? And, you know, like in six months to a year. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was, it was quite a shock. And the, um, the instant reaction, the instant, uh, uh, I would even wonder if some of it wasn't, you know, prepared ahead of time, um, mm -hmm. trying, to, trying to censor the film, basically. Mm -hmm. Well, before getting into the censorship topic, which I definitely want to talk about, and frankly, I've been involved with aspects of that myself, uh, not doing the censoring, but being censored. Do you feel like the film has triggered at least aspects of the discussion that you had hoped? Um, oh yeah, I think there's a, you know, at one of our test screenings, the, before the film festival, the 70% of the audience didn't know who Bill McKibben was. Hmm. There's a big 
world out there. And even when I was early on before the film began to take on, um, you know, its current shape where we really challenged the current environmental movement, um, just in trying to reach out to the environmental movement to partner on things like fighting biomass mm -hmm. or, uh, hey, what the hell? The trees are all dying. Uh, why isn't anybody paying attention? And I, I kept running into weird brick walls with my concern about the forest. You'd think that would be the first thing people would care about. I wrote, mm -hmm. I was paid big money to write a huge article for Sierra Magazine on the dying trees. And at the last minute, I got a call from somebody uh, in the Sierra Club I said, you know, we just we don't want to tell, talk about the trees dying because you know we're we're trying to save, raise money to save the trees, and if everybody thinks they're dying, you know, it's like, so I developed this, um, post what I call post uh, environmentalist stress disorder, um, <laughs> where just things were never what they seem, not only with green energy but with the entire environmental movement. So, yeah. um, our comments, what we found is from civilians, from people not enmeshed, are just have been 90% positive. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just, so that keeps us keeps us going. And just, um, but the, uh, the noise level by these groups, mm. um, it's just been phenomenal. And, you know, they're very well funded. We are not funded. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're getting by on fumes. So it's been a little... Um, but but the, you asked if the discussion, mm -hmm. I think the discussion has, has begun and we've got a long way to go. But um, I think like the Extinction Rebellion, being a, having the courage to use the word extinction, mm -hmm. I think the it's not a film about energy. It's a film about our delusion that there is such a green thing as a green future before us, green technology that's in the way of us accepting that um, we're in we're in collapse right now. Mm -hmm. And if we don't make the right arrangements. So I, I think that discussion is happening. And I think people that are concerned about overconsumption, overpopulation, humans hitting limits, degrowth, extinction, biodiversity collapse. Now there's, you know, a film out there that's a, that's a calling card for those issues. Um, so let's, let's check back in a year or two, because I worked on capitalism, a love story, for instance, mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, it didn't do as well at the box office as some other films, but, Geez, what's funny is a couple of years later, everybody's talking about maybe capitalism isn't such a great idea, and the word socialism is in the common vernacular. I worked on uh, Fahrenheit 9-11. People forget that we were not only terrified to make that movie um, because of the, the, the time uh, we were in, but also, um, you know, that, the movie was very controversial. Um, and now you look back and nobody questions what's in Fahrenheit 9/11, right? As anything but but history. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll know the answer to that in a couple of years. Yeah, it's like a time release capsule. It takes a little while to kick in sometimes. But if you look at the comments on YouTube, that's some of what blew blew me away the most. Yeah, they're almost entirely positive, and folks who are just almost like being woken up for the first time. And you know, of course, some folks saying, "Wow, I'm really depressed right now." But that's kind of that stage that they need to be shocked into a different state of mind and then realizing, okay, now that I've got this different worldview on things, we can move forward. So I, I urge anyone who, uh, who has maybe been hearing just primarily negative aspects from the media to go ahead and look at the comments on that YouTube video. And it just blew, blew me away. I've read thousands of them. I just think it's fascinating. But, but I did want to ask, so let's talk a little bit about the censorship campaign because it's almost like Obviously, the film itself is extremely important and all of the issues brought up in the film, which kind of go across the board, like you say, not just about energy or things like that, but it's brought up these other issues that I think are also important, such as there is an organized censorship campaign, as in emails sent around, and this was led, they say, but he definitely was involved with this uh, documentary filmmaker. How ironic is that, right? Another documentary filmmaker has been a part of a censorship campaign to take the film down, which uh, <laughs> sort of worked for a little bit. But did that surprise you? Not just the opposition. I'm sure you would have expected opposition. You and I are not naive. We've been you know, dissident environmentalists, whatever you want to call it, for a long time, critiquing the environmental movement from the inside to improve it. But this idea of people saying, oh, we disagree. And guess what? We are going to make it so you no longer have a voice. 
Yeah, that that's a little shocking. I mean, the uh, and it was very quick. And, uh, you know, so you wonder what that's about. But, you know, there's a difference between you and I and some of our attackers. Um, I don't think you get money from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, do you? Not the Rockefeller I, Foundation? Not that I know of. You know, and I don't know what the direct connection there is, but um, I don't think, you know, some of our attackers, uh, the uh, the fellow that um, claimed, you know, that we didn't have a fair use right to the uh, mm -hmm. rare earth footage um, gets funding from, um, uh, you know, when Bill McKibben stumbles over, uh, uh, is it the Rasmussen Foundation, Sweden? You know, his group gets funding from that same um, organization. Well, who is the Rasmussen? Who are the Rasmussens? Well, they're billionaire bankers and what some might call, you know, hedge fund investors. You know, so, um, you know, so it's just shocking. But that's what you see in the movie. You see environmentalists, so-called environmentalists, carrying the water of the investment class in the name of saving the planet. Um, but what shocked me was that he got, you know, Josh Fox got away with lying. He got away with claiming we had a, um, distributor, some people we didn't even know. Mm -hmm. Um, and he kept lying even when that so-called distributor, uh, said, Hey, we have nothing to do with these guys. We're not their distributor. He continued to say that. And then he, he changed the wording slightly and the media ran with it. Um, and, uh, it's a little bit of an eye opener when you think about what's happened to people like, uh, Chris Hedges, hmm. uh, who I was on his uh, show a couple days ago, uh, Derek Jensen, um, many people who, who are outliers and uh, speak their own truth. You know, people can decide what's what's true. But uh, when Chris, somebody like Chris Hedges basically gets shut out of the liberal media, hmm. forget the environmental part. It's like, who have we become? What is the New York Times? What is the nation when they won't publish Chris Hedges? And then, so without Michael Moore's involvement, I don't know what would happen to us. But you know, the Guardian printed a, uh, uh, you know, a story um, just repeating the calls for censorship. Um, you know, a cli you know, climate scientists, climate experts, whatever however they worded, call for Michael Moore, you know, uh, documentary "Plan of the Humans" to be pulled. It's like that's the headline. Mm -hmm. And then I wrote, I spent a week writing a response, and they didn't even answer. That, in my opinion, as a longtime journalist who's been a part of all sorts of journalist organizations, I've won awards. I say that just to say I, I come from a legitimate journalist background. I think that is journalist malpractice. I think it's unethical. I think it sort of spells the end to journalism. It's not like the editors have to agree with you. If that's what it's come to, where an editor has to agree with a specific opinion piece in order for them to run it in their publication, especially when there's already been an attack piece, and really that's the way a lot of that can be framed. Uh, it, there were attack pieces. There was stuff that was borderline libelous, stuff that frankly if I was accused of, I would probably have had my attorney involved because just really egregious stuff. And it's like, okay, you guys launched this stuff. We all get to say things. Here's our response. And they don't even let you have a response. Unbelievable. Newsweek did the same thing. They, they did this op-ed by Michael Mann, a uh, so-called climate scientist. Um, and, you know, he said that uh, things like, you know, um, we had not been, you know, we were turned on by multiple uh, outlets for, you know, um, it's like, how would he know that he doesn't, we weren't, we only pitched the film to one place. And, uh, after that we were like, okay, we're going to carve our own path here. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, there were just inaccuracies aside from the accusations about, uh, you know, population control, you know, we never use the word population control, but what do they want you to look away from? You know, they don't want you to, you know, nobody's talking about so many parts of the film, like in the center of the film where we have the discussion about whether our side has taken on green, uh, the idea of a green savior, you know, green renewable energy, which when you think about it, that hippies and environmentalists could ever believe that technology could be green mm -hmm. uh, is just one of the biggest bait and switches in the history of humankind. But, you know, that, that you know, we're using our green, uh, you know, uh, our beliefs in, in green sustainability as a, uh, as a cushion against understanding that there is no um, way for this technological civilization to, to, to maintain itself. 
And once you realize that, it changes everything uh, because you realize that this the bottom is is going to and is already falling out. Uh, they don't want you to look at the parts of the film that show you even when you try and uh, divest from fossil fuels, you're, you're still wind up investing in all these things that have to do with a capitalist industrialist, industrialist society. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so, so, so many more parts of the film need to be talked about, but the, you know, the, they wanted to, con in a sense, there's a censorship and then, then they're, then they're, they want to keep the discussion stuck in things like, Oh, you know, you said solar panels are eight percent efficient. Well, we've got better technology now. Yes, sir, re Bob. Yeah. We got twenty percent efficient solar panels. Right, right. Uh. <laughs> yeah, it's basically a distraction. I mean, I went through all of the critiques of the film. I, I read. I'm not going to say more than anyone out there, but I would say more than pretty much the vast majority of people in the world. I followed the critique of this film. And I wrote a piece where I addressed some of the critique, which was actually the hardest piece I've ever gotten, the, the most difficult time I've had publishing a piece, which is uh, because of the content. But I went through the critiques and, and I think people can have differing opinions on stuff and, and they can contest with certain opinions and that, that's fine. But the idea that the film contains lies or falsehoods, that's just not true. It's just not true. But I think what happens is people have such a fixed ideology that they literally think anything that they disagree with is a falsehood. So it's almost like I think there are some people who are deliberately going after it perniciously. And I think others just can't see, you know, past their own filters that they've placed in their brains. You know, one of the things that the film and uh, referring to the center section where we have the discussion about uh, you know, whether all humans have some kind of religion or belief system that protects them from, you know, protects us from our fear of death, um, you know, that this is this is a big turnaround for, for people. And you're, and you're absolutely right. And, and I don't mean to um, to be uh, too cynical about everyone. It's just those with a vested interest are very angry and want to keep you embedded in that. But just because I mentioned the 8% as an example, they say, oh, the film is incorrect. It's inaccurate. Well, uh, I never in the film said this represents all solar panels for all times. Of course not. That was the only place where somebody happened to volunteer the efficiency of the solar panels that we were looking at. Um, and, you know, so if if they would have bothered, they would have looked at those. And you can see right in the film, they're, they're, the guy's flexing it. And th they're thin film solar panels, which were 8% um, efficient. And you, you can just look up and see that Tesla... Uh, rooftop solar panels that, that were sold last year, somebody did an analysis and they came out to, at best, 10%. Um, but it's it's distracting you from the giant industrial planet-wrecking civilization that is necessary to create a solar panel. Yep. And that's not going to change. It's distracting you from even if they were 100% efficient. I don't know uh, where you're at, but in Michigan we have this thing called night, and <laughs> they, they work at 0%. For long periods of time, we also have this thing called, you know, October, November, December, January, February, March, and April, where it's cloudy and the days are short. Yeah. And, you know, and, and so it's it's preventing the real discussion. You know, wind turbines um, can, you know, I, I was looking at a study that showed that wind turbines uh, essentially, you know, how much, how often do they generate their, their actual full rated output? Well, it's close to 0%. It's like 1% in, in this one study I was looking at. So, you know, again, this is a smaller part of the discussion, but um, we show expert after expert who's involved in the solar industry, not these people that are in the marketing part of the solar industry called the environmental movement, but who actually are deep into the weeds and, and who just say over and over again, the intermittency is a profound issue that's... Uh, uh, James, and so in my rebuttal in Newsweek, I didn't get a chance to say th those 8% efficient panels are still in use today, including by Tesla. Right. Uh, I didn't get a chance to say that James Hansen, um, who, the scientist who helped break open the climate movement uh, from NASA, he doesn't believe that renewables can power civilization, and he cites the intermittency as the number one reason. Um, so they've... Uh, They've successfully in 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 the environmental media in the left media um, sort of um, kept us from having the right discussion. But um, 
but fortunately, the people haven't put up with it. You know, we had, um, I think we're probably the most reviewed movie uh, I've ever heard of. <laughs> of the, uh, so It's impressive. So you all tried to get pieces published as well, I think, at Common Dreams. I think that's what Michael had said on his podcast. Uh, yeah, they rejected um, a piece, uh, and uh, yeah, the New Newsweek rejected a rebuttal. Um, we had sent some op-eds to the New York Times, didn't hear back. Um, I tried to get my Huffington Post um, thing going. This was, you know, some before some of the scuttle got going, but still, um, it's just been tremendously uh, strange uh, because it used to be um, before I, I I switched into filmmaking, I had a brief career uh, for a few years uh, writing for several newspapers and magazines myself. And it used to be pretty much anything I wrote, I could get out there, yep. you know, um, at will. Yep. Well, you know, I mean, it's just the idea that <laughs> you folks don't have enough prominence to get your stuff in there, especially when you're responding to attacks, uh, the idea that the film and the topics it brings up aren't newsworthy. It belies their previous reporting. I mean, Lots of stuff on climate stuff, environmental issues, which I'm thankful for. I'm glad that legacy media is picking up more on that. You know, a lot around Greta Thunberg and all that. So clearly that's in their wheelhouse. But all of a sudden, well, this is a perspective we don't really want to put out there. And, and it's, I guess, one thing to expect it from legacy media, but another for left environmental journals. And I will say that, so this piece that I wrote, I wrote it a damn month ago, and I thought this would be like, great. You know, all of this is happening right now. I'm going to put this out there because I feel like I did a little bit of critique of the critique because I feel like people need a little bit of a key to sort of understand where other folks are coming from. So I put out this piece and I started with every single publication that had run negative commentary. So not just articles, but they had published opinion pieces, many of which I've were unhinged and outlandish, including um, here's the title. Why Planet of the Humans is Crap. That, that's the very thought-provoking title that starts out, um, basically, I'd have to go look at it again. Here's Why Planet of the Humans is so effing bad. That's the beginning of that, that thought piece. So anyway, I, I submitted to each of these places, you know, didn't hear back from any of them. And then I started saying, okay, well, I'm going to go back to some of my staples, places I've been writing for for years Places that where they know me, you know, I'm a nobody, so fine, these other places don't want to publish my stuff, whatever. Even shut down by those publications. And finally, one of them I decided, I'm going to have to ask you why. And what they said was, <laughs> I mean, my article is finally up on Counterpunch, on, sorry, on Counterpunch, so folks can check it out if they want Big Green Meltdown over Planet of the Humans. But basically, what these editors said was my pace was, quote, pretty weak and quote, did not advance the conversation. Now, you can say a lot of stuff about my writing. I'm not pretending everything I write is great or even that this piece was amazing. But the idea that after working on these particular topics for years and writing all these articles that just all of a sudden my stuff is pretty weak and doesn't advance a conversation. I, I sniffed a bit of a rat. I followed up a little bit more. And basically, yeah, they didn't, they didn't want to engage with me whatsoever. I realized how deep the rabbit hole went. I didn't actually think it went that deep. I thought it would be just a lot of other places and there'd be a lot of other reasons for shutting down a piece. But no, I found it was actually because of the content, basically writing about this film. And I do want to, this is something I just found out today and I, and I don't care what blowback it creates, but even the place that ran my piece, one of the other editors who I know for a fact does not like the film because he tweeted about it, rejected my piece after it already ran. So he somehow picked up on the email when I submitted it. And then he said, yeah, I'm sorry, we're not going to run your piece. It, was, it had already run. And so how bizarre, I was even rejected by a place that ran my piece. None of this has ever happened to me in about 15 years of writing and writing professionally. You know, I didn't charge anything for this article. So I just want to tell you, Jeff, it's not just you, it, it's this topic. And I've talked to other folks about this as well. And yeah, it really, it really blew my mind. Well, just think about how we don't know that James Hansen doesn't think um, green energy could save us. You know, why isn't that, why isn't he called when stories run about green energy to get his, his, his thoughts? It's, 
It's um, what I expected was that at least in the um, environmental media media and the uh, liberal media, that we would then create a dialogue where um, Democracy Now, for instance, might, um, you know, Amy Goodman might choose to have us on or um, the nation might have a discussion with us. Instead, they've run attack things. And, and uh, you know, The Guardian, here's what's interesting. Um, later, that they, when they think they've got you in a certain position, they will... Um, they will reach out. So the Guardian, um, like a few hours after Toby Keith uh, filed the complaint with YouTube, the copyright infringement for our 24 seconds from his film that was uh, four seconds in our film, sped up. Um, clearly fair use. It's a rare earth mine in China. We're not going to go there and film that rare earth um, destruction. Uh, you know, um, it's historical footage. It's it's one of a kind footage. It's like the best case to me for fair use. Um, hours after he filed it, and, you know, it was on um, Memorial Day, so it was a quiet day in the you know in the world of news. But suddenly we get an email from the Guardian. Would you like to respond to the uh, takedown of your film? Hmm. Yep. Okay. Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't want to. You know, but that. That's just crazy, you know. Yeah. Um, and Toby Keith had worked. So Toby Smith is his name. Toby Keith is a famous to country musician. Toby, sorry, sorry about <laughs> he that. He is Toby uninvolved. Smith, yeah. <laughs> uh, Toby Smith, you know, actually has a has a working relationship with the Guardian, um, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's a uh, it's a little disheartening. But I guess what it's it's a testament to me, you know, with humility, um, to the power of the film, that one film could undo the, their story that they're afraid of. It's also a testament to how deep um, this one of the central premises of, of the film is. When I say it's not a film about energy, it's like War and Peace is not a, we don't even remember what, what war that was about, right? It's a, it's a story of humans yes. and what we do. And this, this is, um, you know, we um, uh, are using our belief in green to keep us from facing the true apocalypse that's before us. And as crazy as it sounds, climate change, which I began this journey like worried sick, and I still am about climate change, but I began to realize even the narrow focus on climate change mm -hmm. is a form of denial. Sure. Because we're hitting limits on so many fronts. And so with by focusing on climate change, obsessing over it, in the media and in the environmental movement, A, it yields up uh, funding, to be honest with you. A lot of the, the, uh, the billionaires and the, and the wealthy foundations love this single focus story. Um, but it'll, it allows us to believe that there's, if we can only take care of the carbon, right. if we can only take care of this one thing, somehow we can make it okay. Um, and so it's not gonna be okay, even if everything we say about green energy was true and we could get the carbon out, it's still not going to be okay because we humans as a species and as a giant industrial civilization are heading off the cliff. And to the extent somebody came down with, with humans doing what we're doing all across the planet and said, oh, gee, you guys are so cute, so clever, so beautiful, so wonderful. Here's another magic source of energy, all the energy you want for free. It's like, what are we going to do with that? We're, we're going to head off the cliff faster. And, and indeed, that's what's been happening. Yeah, it's interesting because I, of course, and I think you do as well, think that the climate movement has called attention to an important, extremely important thing, which is climate change. And it is it is uh, it does touch many aspects. But the idea that that's the end all be all not only distracts us from other issues, it can actually make certain things worse. Of course, already when we bring this up, this is too much for your typical environmentalist to process because it's almost like become what you, you're critiquing the environmental movement. You must be anti-environmentalist. No, we're trying to improve it and not just pretend and feel good about ourselves. So I, I totally agree with that assessment. And kind of on that note, Bill McKibben was one of the individuals who is included in your film. Uh, you talk about some of his support for basically logging forests for energy, known as biomass energy. And that's a topic I am intimately familiar with because when I was in Vermont working to call attention to the environmental and health impacts and climate impacts of burning trees for fossil fuels, 
Bill McKibben was supporting biomass. And every time I would sort of try to bring up this issue, I would get shot down. And the argument was, well, if Bill McKibben supports it, it can't be a bad thing. So I was called all sorts of things like a supporter of coal, which is insane because I've always been advocating against fossil fuel use. So all of this nonsense stuff. So I experienced this years and years and years ago. And so in the film, it shows McKibben basically, well, exactly saying the words that came out of his mouth around biomass. And then towards the end of the film, at the very end, you point out how over time McKibben started writing a couple pieces. And by a couple, I do mean a handful of articles where he said he no longer supports, frankly, some aspects of biomass. It's biomass power versus biomass heating and use for transportation fuels are, are very you know, it's a bigger topic. So it's actually 43% of quote renewable energy in the U.S. is still still biomass. Some folks are trying to say, oh, there's only just a couple percent yeah, for electricity. So biomass is that whole big thing. But anyway, um, so you, you talk about McKibben in there. You, you point out towards the end of the film how he has sort of changed his tune on aspects of biomass. And a lot of folks, including McKibben himself, were very offended that you included this in the film. So I guess uh, I'd just be curious. So why did you include it in the film? And, and what's your response to the critiques for basically showing recordings of him talking? <laughs> I don't think he's changed his tune. Yeah. No. Have you seen bio? Have you what, have you seen the giant anti biomass campaign by 350.org? <laughs> have you seen the giant biomass campaign by Sierra Club? Fair. I don't believe they changed their tune at all. Mixed messaging about this is a topic covered in the film. Mm. And what they don't like is they got caught and called out. You know, if I was the leader of the environmental movement and I had dedicated a clean coal plant, then after somebody confronted me about that, I wrote an essay about it. <laughs> oh, I'm against clean coal. And then I didn't say a single thing about it. And then after a film came out calling me out about my support of clean coal, then I wrote another op-ed you think anybody would think that I had somehow come around, that mm -hmm. that was sufficient? No. Um, and, and it's, you know, what, no, no, that wasn't, nobody would think it was just a small little mistake if the leader of the environmental movement came out to support a small, you know, little innocent clean coal plant. <laughs> um, I didn't make him say, we must do this everywhere. You know, and, you know, what they want, he and they want you to avoid is, it was so easy for all the citizens to say, oh, no, we don't like biomass. And, and by the way, they also instantly said they don't like biofuels. Right. The Sierra Club and Bill McKibben's op-eds were so narrow. And the, it's hard for people to, that don't know about biomass and biofuels to understand that. To say that you're against the cutting and burning of forests for electricity. Mm -hmm. Well, that leaves this gap with so many different kinds of biomass and biofuels Yes. that are out there. And again, neither of them mentioned biofuels. Yep. But look at what just is in the film. I mean, he supported 25 by 25 in Michigan. Did he say, I support the solar and wind, but please take out the biomass and biofuels? No. And that is the problem with the entire supposed anti-biomass and biofuels movement. They're trying to get this compromised win. And you never, everybody knows that ethanol is a crazy, crazy idea. The amount of ethanol which is you know, using corn to make a biofuel, basically, uh, the, lo the amount of land in the United States that's dedicated to, bio to ethanol is about the same as the amount of land dedicated to growing food for humans. Yeah. It's huge. Yep. You, crickets from Bill McKibben and everyone else. Then he sits on stage with David Blood, who is part of you know, uh, the investment fund with Al Gore. They have this a fund within their fund for biomass and biofuels. Did Bill McKibben call him out on that? No. Um, even at the end of the film, currently in the year 2019 and 2020, uh, they've since dropped that. Bill McKibben had recommended this fund, the Green Century Fund, and, and 350 had as well, that contained BlackRock, the world's largest logging company, and Warehouser, who has biomass, a biomass interest, and then Archer, Archer Daniels Midland, who's into biofuels. Mm -hmm. So it's, and not to go on, and so what's happened since then? Um, since you brought it up, I mean, mm -hmm. this is a chance to talk about it. Just, Bill McKibben went on The Nation a few weeks ago, and 
he they talked about Planet of the Humans, and he you know was you know not happy with this you know with um, I think he said some some of the you know I, frankly I didn't want to listen to it, but you know he talked about the movie. Um, who's who was the sponsor of his nation appearance? Mm. Dominie Sustainable Solutions Fund, a Wall Street investment fund with six hundred million dollars in holdings. Yep. They they claim they have in their portfolio. Um, this company called, uh, let me look it up, Amoresco, which I'm quoting here, uh, they, they have large-scale biomass to energy plants it's mm-hmm. on their own website, and they show them shoveling wood chips. Uh, they also have um, Claben SA, a company in, that's the largest um, paper company, logging company in Brazil to make um, uh, pulp. And they have a biomass plant. In fact, a few days after Bill McKibben appeared on The Nation, sponsored by Domini, um, they, uh, they, they announced another biomass plant. And you could say, okay, well, it was just an accident. But then Bill McKibben went back on The Nation. And again, the whole intro was sponsored by this, you know, this hedge fund, this investment company that includes biomass. It's like thing after thing. So, so this is a problem with Bill McKibben and the Sierra Club and all these groups is that they can say they're against biomass, right? Um, and they can go lobby quietly in Congress, um, but you know, legislation after legislation after legislation. You know, the uh, Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, if you look that up, this is not talked about at all. Um, out of the hundred and something models, like a hundred of them, like over ninety-five percent. Uh, contained this scheme called bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. Yep. What what they wanted to do was basically commodify the forests and farmlands of the world to grow biofuels and biomass and then burn them in power plants and then use clean coal technology to capture the carbon. Mm-hmm. And that was at the heart of most all of the plans coming out of the Paris Climate Agreement. Did what have you heard Bill McKibben or the Sierra Club or any of them call that out? Do you see anything on their websites about how horrible that would be? Do you see anything right now about the uh, in the 2019 Democratic bills that, that the Biomass Magazine was bragging about because they've got the biodiesel credit, the ethanol, this and that credit? Mm-hmm. You know, there's so many different kinds of biomass and biofuels, including this tricky one. Um, oh, one, one, one um, green energy plan that Bill McKibben had endorsed of uh, sure it had solar and wind, but it also had second generation biofuels. Okay. Now, what do those include? Those also include um, the possibility of cutting forests and dissolving them with a genetically modified organism to turn into ethanol to burn in cars. Yep. So this is how tricky it is, and this is why um, you know that was in the film, and we showed the duplicity of the environmental organizations having policies, oh, I'm against it. Right. But all these backdoor things have enabled it. And if you just step back and think about what's happened, there's, there's been since 2009 when that he dedicated that biomass plant, biomass and biofuels ramped way in the hell up. Yes. There's no visible opposition. And quite frankly, I know there's people fighting biomass plants, and many of them are well intended and have done good work and had some successes. But um, there's a reason why they haven't broken through into the mainstream environmental movement. And I believe that reason is that, you know, I can't say what bargains have been made, but I think too many deals with the devil have been made mm-hmm. all across the board that we don't know about by environmental leaders. And they're not willing to stand up it's to agriculture and big timber and these companies. Um, we we had a, a guy from a large foundation that we met with, you know, you know I'll, I'll be honest, you know, we were saying, oh, could there be a, a uh, wealthy foundation that could believe in this story and, uh, you know, come to find out, sitting across the the, uh, the table f- from this fellow, well, we're invested in all these forest holdings around the world, too. Sure. Of course. Yeah. Well, so a lot of folks maybe maybe you... who aren't as familiar with the biomass issue don't realize how it's basically a litmus test. Would you would you agree with that in terms of you know, your genuine commitment to issues of climate and environment. Because you say, okay, we gotta, we gotta get off fossil fuels. That, that's a legitimate, you know, a legitimate way of looking at things. So therefore, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the forests that are already doing this carbon storing work on their own, 
providing all these other benefits for wildlife and just habitat, you know, the right for a forest to exist, much less the human benefits of clean air and, um, you know, preventing flooding and soil erosion and things like that. So we're gonna actually take this and use this to solve our environmental problem. I mean, it's almost, it utilizes seventh grade science if that, I think if you talk to probably an eight year old and you say, hey, uh, we're, we're having some environmental issues out here. We're thinking of, see that forest back there? We're thinking of cutting it all down to help with that. What do you think? Do you think that's a good idea? And I, I think most eight year olds would say, that sounds like a bad idea. And <laughs> they would be right. But pretty much everything you've said about what's going on, I think, with, around the biomass issue is, is accurate. Even the vast majority, I wouldn't say all, because I do know and I have worked with some folks that are opposed to bioenergy across the board, but most of the folks who say they're opposed to biomass, they're opposed to specific forms of it. And, and I think McKibben is one of those. Also, folks right now, if, if you look into a lot of folks who consider themselves part of the anti-biomass movement, uh, I can tell you for a fact that they actually fought the elements of the movement that wanted to end support for all biomass. They actually wanted to keep supporting certain forms of biomass. They went after funders. It, it was pretty, pretty messy. So I was intimately involved with this back in the day. And I, and I think another point of yours was, so when all of these facilities, so many of them were built, it was around uh, yeah, 2008, nine with all the stimulus funding through Obama. And I don't remember how many, basically dozens of these large biomass facilities were built, many of which are still operating today. It, I would like, if, if McKibben does oppose biomass, I would like to see him trying to join with the communities to shut those facilities down, talking to the communities that are dealing with the impacts of the air pollution and the truck traffic and the, the forest degradation. And the other aspect to biomass, which wasn't mentioned, is that trash burning is also considered biomass. And a lot of these trash incinerators, not only the air pollution issues, uh, dioxin and things like that, uh, and encourages more waste, but a lot of them are, are cited in poor communities and communities of color. So I worked with an organization that was very concerned with this environmental justice issue of incinerators, and that's been a long time concern of communities of color. And the reality is a lot of biomass has sort of fallen by the wayside for at least now in terms of these biomass power plants because natural gas, we're, we're having that fracking boom right now and it's a bubble, and my concern is that when that bubble bursts, and it will burst, then biomass is going to be back, you know, not in every way back on the table. And, and it already is currently going on. Like you said, these facilities still exist. And I just saw an article that said how many tons of wood pellets are being shipped overseas uh, right now. So I just, here it is. U.S. wood pellet exports reach 595,166 me metric tons in Da, 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 in April, <laughs> in one month, not the year, month. Wow. So it's, it's going on it's, right now. It's going on and it's, you know, again, uh, to the extent that we go with the Paris Climate Agreement, it's, it's, it's the, the plan would be to drastically ramp it up around the world. And yes. even right now, I'm just looking at a, a, an article in Biomass Magazine, the Department of Energy to fund projects that gasify a mix of coal and biomass. So, right. You know, I just saw an article that they're that they're bragging in England about uh, their renewable energy success, and they're going to go this giant, the world's largest biomass plant, I believe. Um, Drax. They're just so happy, Drax, that they're switching from trees to coal. And let me mention one more complication um, that you see briefly in the movie. But again, uh, we we stopped a, a number of biomass plants from coming to Northern Michigan, and yep. the choice I made in leading this opposition was. No biomass, period. And we got tons and tons of like, why don't you compromise on this? Why don't you compromise? Why don't you just, what about small? And just no biomass. And you can compromise later, but if Bill McKibben, the Sierra Club, the biomass opposition wants to oppose it, if they don't adopt that position, I'll guarantee you they'll never, they'll never get anywhere. Mm -hmm. And as you see briefly in the film, the logging companies love the same language that the compromisers use, um, the biomass done right. They love the idea, oh, we're doing forest restoration. Oh, this is these trees were meant to be regenerated from a clear cut. Oh, you know, we're doing thinning, we're using forest residues, we're using waste products. So aside from the idea of just going and cutting a forest to burn it, um, you do need to really hold trees to get enough bang for your buck. But a lot of what's happening in the name of biomass and biofuels 
is being supported by the timber industry because it gives them a way to take uh, anything that they can't sell or, you know, the, um, the parts of logs and things uh, and, and to build these plants and to get green energy subsidies yes. for their pulp mills and their, their logging operations. So I, I want to go back to what you said earlier. I think it's so important. The fact, and, and, and this might have included me temporarily, you know, I burned wood for a while, I, you know, so I thought maybe on that scale, I was, I was fine. But, you know, when I first heard about biomass, I didn't know what to think about it. Um, and I think if Paris is like this, it's a sign that we've lost our minds. <laughs> the fact that we're even thinking about the carbon part of the forest, again, this is what I'm saying about the climate-focused story, as horrible as climate change is, is, is it's a symptom of humans out of control on this planet. Mm. And the fact that we would reduce a forest to its carbon value and its energy value, what about the wolverines? What about the pine martens? Right. You know, what about the grosbeaks? What about the hawks? What about the rabbits? You know, what about the, the you know, sure, you know, and basically these commercial forests, um, maybe, you know, you can comment on this, are, are basically deserts. Mm. I mean, and as far as the wildlife is concerned, and when we think about the decline of insects around the world, the decline of pollinators, you know, trees are flowering plants. And, you know, so we're shutting out um, the story of nature uh, in rapid decline right. during our lifetimes. And we're exchanging it for a story of, if only we can figure out a way to have energy that doesn't use carbon then we're going to stop the apocalypse. And no, um, and I just want to just just before we move on, and I, you know, however much time we have left, I just want to be clear: there is no replacement for fossil fuels. Sorry, there is no such thing, and there's never going to be. And the sooner we accept that, we'll understand what my one of my points I didn't say in the movie, but I I want to say now is that the only way to let, use less fossil fuels. Well, I guess you, you know, several other people make this point is to use less fossil fuels. And, you know, somehow we have this fantasy that there could be some more innocent form of energy. So some go for nuclear, some go for a solar panel, um, you know, some go for hydrogen. Um, there's not some more innocent form of energy. I'm sorry. It's just it's just it, the fact that we're desperately looking for that suggests that the environmental movement has become about us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's an easy way to have less of an impact, and that's to have less of an impact. But um, there's, you know, um, the thing I wish I could have said more strongly is I don't believe that solar or wind does, does do anything except create a distraction um, in an attempt to make ourselves, to absolve ourselves of our sins for our energy use. And I think we just need to own the reality that... Um, we're sinning, and we need to do, to do less of it. Is is the, uh, but there's no way out. There's no easy. There's no energy way out of this. Um, and the sooner we stop fantasizing that there is, I think the better off we'll be. And I do think that aspect is what frightens a lot of people, and I do think is behind a lot of the censorship and the pushback against the film is people don't want to acknowledge the fact that. You know, whatever your take on, like I personally, I, you know, or if people want to put up some solar panels on their roof and if I have a property at some point, I might do that. But the idea that that is going to solve the problem, I, I totally agree with you. I don't think that that is where we need to be dealing with the issue. Ultimately, we need to be looking at what is our consumption? How do we live? You know, and I did bring that up in my piece. And I think that was also what was threatening about my piece is that I did want to go into the deeper layer. And I think a lot of environmentalists, let's just say that the mainstream environmentalists that are funded by corporate foundations, they either don't get that or they don't want to get that. I think it's a little bit of both because it's, you know, in, in fairness, to the, um, their vociferous response suggests a couple things to me. You know, I do think they're in, uh, involved, and I'm not saying they're taking money, but they're involved with people and systems that have a vested interest in this. Um, sure, sure. And I do, I do think it's there's some guilt involved because, yeah. you know, um, I think many of our critics know the truth. They know it's broader than this. They know it's going to take more. Um, and I think Bill McKibben knows that very, very well. And the fact that they've uh, 
led the movement in this direction, I think part of them knows that that was a big mistake. Um, but hmm. it's also this, to the extent this has become a, a green religion that's going to save us from our, um, that's going to, this promising this amazing future hmm. um, in the name of green, it's, it's, it's a hard turnaround. And I'll just say for myself, um, I was never more depressed than when I was not able to work on this story. And um, as I developed, uh, you know, just even the brief time we had together in the in the woods and the people that did join together and uh, fought biomass, um, you know, meeting Ozzy and finding other people, I think finding allies who accept that we're in this time of um, incipient collapse and we need to get ahead of that while we take care of everyone. Um, once that battle is joined, there's some, there's some, um, there's the, the darkness can lift. I think it's a transition from, um, our previous, uh, religion of environmentalism. Um, you know, and again, there are many things, good things done in the environmental world, but this, but the overarching thing has become a, a belief system, um, that's not going to save us. And so as we transition to something different, um, there can be some pain and, and darkness, but um, I do believe we come out the other side. And I do believe that's the only hope we have is to have these conversations and to have them. Um, I hope I've been respectful to the people I'm uh, critiquing here. Um, you know, stay away from name calling and uh, always keep our hands out because um, things can change very quickly. And uh, Bill McKibben went on 60 Minutes a few weeks ago and uh, he's basically said that growth has to be over. I was like stunned. I don't know if he's trying to get ahead mm -hmm. of the movie or he's revisiting his old self, but man, if Bill McKibben, you know, would not just say that on TV, uh, just like, you know, just don't write an op-ed about biomass, but if he would lead the charge to say, our only hope is, is whether you call it degrowth or whatever it is, our only hope is for less to be the new more and for us to take care of everyone in that process. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the, the next climate talks shouldn't be climate talks. They should be talks about how we're going to uh, begin to power down this industrial monster, um, growth monster. Um, so, think you know that's where, that's where my hope is, and uh, that and if I I don't know if you know my expectation is that um, if envi the environmental movement doesn't change, we'll just change the world around them. And I think that's a really excellent point. Um, yeah, so my piece that I had put out that was so hard to get published, I've gotten more positive feedback than any other piece I've written. I had mentioned that before to you and you know, all these emails from f folks who are across the board. So radical environmentalists, career environmentalists, and then just folks who maybe are just starting to wake up to this issue. So I do think that there is a lot of interest out there and there are folks who want to engage in this. I guess my question is, does the old environmental movement, do we just have to let that die and create something else? Or like you say, around it, can it be reformed? What is that going to look like? Even the concept of an environmental movement, do those terms need to change? Wow, that's a very good question. And that's reminding me of, um, you know, what uh, some of our discussions after our initial um, screenings before the film was released, where I don't know the answer, but now, Finally, we're asking some of the right questions, and um, I think I would like this movie to be a trigger for, um, you know, how do how does how do how does social change happen? And we're faced with the first time an entire species ac across an entire planet uh, finding a way to change. Um, you know, has there ever been an example of a species that was able to avoid a running off the cliff um, of you know, it's explosive population and consumption growth and pulling itself back. Have there been civilizations that have done that? Most civilizations only last a few hundred years and we're, we're about that at that expiration date now. So this is the territory which I hope to move forward in and we're discussing a lot of the controversy, but I really want my future work to be in two areas, accepting the collapse of the natural world is well underway and the collapse of civilization as we know it is, is, is already start, also started, um, maybe not as far along. Mm -hmm. And what arrangements could we make to make this a gentle landing for humans and non-humans alike? That's what I'm interested in.
Um, and uh, Yep. Yeah, and there have been entities that have been working on aspects of that. I was part of something called Transition Towns, which is kind of about adaptation. So the idea, I still think probably, and, and maybe you can agree, there's still things to push back against in terms of extraction, destruction of forests, pollution of waterways, etc., overfishing. But at the same time, we also need to probably be accepting that there is this unraveling going on and, and to not be in denial about it anymore and to respond to it. So to start being resilient and adapt to that. And yeah, I think it's interesting where I don't think mm. any of us have all the answers and nor, nor should we, but I, I really like what you said on this other, it might've been Michael Moore's podcast or your own podcast, which I do want to mention in a moment, but basically, you know, what are the solutions? You know, what, how do we move forward? What do we, what do we fix? What are, and you're saying, well, I, I think we need to learn more and we need to look at like you said, asking the right questions. We need to reframe the problem properly. And I think that's what Planet of the Humans does. I don't think you have to agree with everything in Planet of the Humans to understand how it has given us that necessary reframe. And the irony is that most environmentalists, one in particular I was talking to is like, oh, this and this and this. And then you get him talking about it and you realize he actually agrees with 90% of what's in your film. He just fixates on these nitpicking details that he disagrees with. And so I do think there is way more support for that. Maybe it's just unconscious. They haven't fully accepted it yet, but I think it's out there. And I think you're absolutely right. I think we need to not just where, oh, well, here's the thing we're going to do for sure because we already know. Well, clearly we, we don't know. Just how long was it? Uh, 10 years ago when, 15 years ago, let, let's just say that, you know, McKibb and I, I agree, he is still supporting aspects of biomass. But, you know, 15 years ago, he had zero reservations about any aspect of it. So one of our biggest environmental leaders is, has advocated for something that is the opposite of a solution that will cause more problems. Clearly, we need to get a little bit better at assessing quote, solutions before we jump into things that are going to do more harm than good. So I, I am for that. But here's my question for you is we need to sit for a moment, let things settle so we can understand what's going on. At the same time, urgency is, you know, things are pretty urgent. So how do we correlate those two? The idea that we need to rethink and the idea that, no, things are unraveling right now. Yeah, that's a very good question. Again, these are the discussions we should be having everywhere, and I, I think it's the movie has helped to trigger those thoughts. So I'm just going to throw out my, um, um, what you know, um, you know, point of view, which you know, the many point of views sh should be shared about this. But I think we need to. I have been remiss in not acting more locally. Um, you know, there, there's. Right now, there's the last endangered piping plovers that are there are near me, you know, and there are people walking their dogs that are helping to undo some of that. And there are people that are watching over them. There are people watching over the last sturgeon. There are people risking their lives uh, all around this world to protect forests. Um, I think we need to decide that going to the climate march was never enough, and we need to get involved locally back in, you know, we, we were able to stop four biomass plants from coming to this area, and there's been... Uh, I don't think there's been one built in Michigan since then. I think there was a small one built, and I heard that it's not being used. Um, you know, so there, there's been bills. You know, all these species require our attention, and we need to support all the efforts um, to protect habitat and species and, and to change our lifestyles and to change how we live. Uh, this community where I live, we doubled the size of the airport. Um, but, well, we were going to put up a little solar array. It's like... You know, we can we, we we can begin to have the conversation about how we're going to change the the environmental movement writ large, or have, form a new one, to talk about limits and to talk about how we're going to adjust to the real reality. But we can also locally we have to do that. Um, there was not one peep when this airport doubled and tripled because, frankly, most of the users of that airport are liberals like me who enjoy trotting around the world. You know. Yeah, uh, I'd like to go back to Hawaii, you know, where I sure. um, for, you know, I need a break from the movie. I deserve it, you know. <laughs> so I really do believe that awareness is the key. And, uh, you know, uh, just, just so many things to list off that we can talk about, but I don't want to get lost in the weeds. But one of them would be um, invest in forests to be set aside. You know, uh, as you see in the movie briefly, a lot of these conservancies 
uh, don't set aside the land. They have, still have forest management plans. So yes. buy some land to set it aside or buy some land and give it to a tribe or an indigenous community that's um, very carefully uh, living with that land. You know, um, there's just so much to be done, but all of it, none of it will matter unless we get this larger context of um, our human presence is probably 100 times past. It is 100 times past where it was a mere two centuries ago. And if we think that that can carry forward into the future indefinitely, uh, we're, we're, we've lost our minds. And so um, I, I don't know what we're going to do about that. All I know is we need to understand the horrible crash that's before us and um, make some different arrangements. You know, if you want to put up some solar panels on your cabin, you know, I, don't pretend you're saving the planet. Realize that it took a planet-wide industrial civilization to bring you those solar panels. It's not local energy. It's just like your iPhone. But the number one thing you can do, whether you have a generator, a power line, or a solar panel, is you know, have a far smaller life in that, in that home or that cabin. And that's, what, that's what's gotten lost in the weeds of trying to power the world through these you know, renewable energy, so-called renewable energy. Yeah, and I think the idea of making sacrifices is a great thing. But personally, I believe that simplifying your lifestyle can actually improve your life. And that's something I'd like to see more out there. It's not a matter of, oh, now you don't get to watch all these amazing TV shows. Maybe it's now that you develop a, more of an ability to uh, play guitar and perform for your friends. You know, So there are all these ways that folks in you know the Buddhist community or whatever have been talking about the voluntary simplicity thing for what uh, millennia <laughs> and how it actually benefits your life so that's one of the things i want to talk about more moving forward and personally i've been doing that more in my life and certainly around this pandemic stuff i've simplified a lot of my activities and i've actually found it's improved my life so and i'm sure i'm not alone in that yeah and you know people that have chosen to have a, a simpler different lifestyle used to be heroes 40 years ago or 50 years ago. Uh, and we need to return to that. But again, it's not just about individual. We have to begin right. to, we have to plan as a civilization, but um, you know, there were no slave owners against slavery. And we have to start, you know, with ourselves doing the best we can. And, you know, even me, I've got, you know, because I'm a composer and a filmmaker and I do the shooting too, I've got like all these cameras all over the place. I've got two and three computers. I've got you know, keyboards, guitars, all these accoutrements. It's like, what the hell? I mean, some days I just think about cashing it all in. <laughs> just, you know, it's just like it's uh, because even uh, in my life, in the work that I do, all this stuff, it, I feel like it affects our brains and my brain in a way that uh, is not good for me. Um, Definitely. So. Yeah, I, I've experienced that too. And yeah, I, I don't think anyone's suggesting that we all live in caves, at least not right now. But, you know, the idea of using technology as a tool rather than becoming a tool of the technology and uh, all of that. And I agree, it's not just about us simplifying and then leaving it that. We have to work on the interior, so our own particular viewpoint and footprint, and then tying it into the larger systems. It's it's not either or, it's all of the above. And it's interesting if, if you're like, hey, let's simplify our lifestyle. People would say, oh, so you don't think that we should do anything about, um, you know, systemic this and that? No, of course, we have to do all of it. <laughs> but you can't just do and, one piece yeah. and pretend like, so yeah, if you're saying down with the system and you know, like I point out a lot of times around, uh, so keep it in the ground. It's like I'm anti-fracking, but I send my check to the natural gas company every single month. There, there's an issue there. There's an issue there. And the the thing is, just to be clear, you know, you're going to, if you live in a cold climate, you're probably going to use heat and to, yes. just to do the le at least in the best you can. But the larger conflict is, Many people here went and, uh, you know, and I oppose the pipelines, you know, I oppo oppose, you know, new fossil fuel plants. But yep. to me, that goes along with, you know, there's there's the uh, a pipeline through the Great Lakes that's between Lake Huron and Lake Michigan that could cause immense amount of damage. And so we'll all go off to protest the pipeline, which we should. But yet, well, they're expanding the airport here. Well, we've doubled the... Um, uh, the m number of people traveling to this area. Well, we've doubled the home values here. Well, there are so many new buildings in Traverse City. Mm -hmm. So in, in a place which we have more environmentalists per square foot than any place probably except San Francisco, you know, we haven't even begun to have this discussion. Uh, a while back, there was a, a planning thing, and it was, it was for smart growth. Well, 
this is why I say awareness and discussion. We, you know, th there's a big change that we need to have because there's no such thing as smart growth. Mm -hmm. Only cancer thinks that there's smart growth. Um, you know, that it could grow indefinitely and uh, not cause a problem. I mean, it's so, and I was told when I went to that, th they actually didn't put an option for no growth on their survey. It was all had to be some kind of growth. Yep. So now we've got all these bike paths, great to use bike paths, but we um, doubled the, the ground and the air transportation coming up, coming in. That's so, a crucial, crucial point, and I agree a lot of the environmental movement ignores and even supports aspects like that. Um, yeah, it, it, we need to have these. So, I mean, we even tore up, we okay. tore up the train tracks, the last train tracks, right. to build the bike paths instead of going, wait a minute, maybe instead of all having electric cars and gas cars, we should... We should have built a train line. So now, 10 years later, there's talk about having the uh, um, trains come back. But, you know, it's uh, so anyways, this yeah. has been fun. And I, I think, yeah. you know, again, I don't have the answers. And, um, and if I said anything incorrect, <laughs> uh, you know, we'll later we'll come back and we'll change our minds and we'll still be correct. It's about being in this journey of discovery right. uh, towards a new way of doing things. It's important. Um, and uh and so I appreciate you for um, being willing to um, engage in this process, Josh, and uh, and your courage in uh, invading the biomass plant and risking arrest. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, that was that was lots then. of fun. But yeah, these are the discussions we need to have. It's sad that we're actually just fighting to be able to even have these discussions, which you know is is awful. But at least we have these avenues. You know, the Green Root Podcast I wanted to create, and I was inspired by Planet of the Humans to put that out there, looking at some of the root causes of the eco crisis and you also have a podcast now and maybe that would be a good way to finish this up tell folks a little bit about that and what you intend to do with it oh yeah it's on um anchor um planet of the humans podcast on anchor i think it's on spotify and other, other places now but i think we want to have some of the discussions that we couldn't have on stage because of the pandemic and, and not being able to show in theater so i'm going to talk to ozzy and our editor angie and to michael about uh, you know, their, how they got involved with the film and what this has been like for them. And then uh, just going forward with, um, I think I'll be doing something on, you know, the signs of um, collapse, societal collapse are all around us, um, not just environmentally. And, uh, you know, what are some of those? Um, and we are going to move forward. I don't know whether it's a series or a next film or, um, a, or a complete surprise, but um, this is just the beginning. And uh, so I look forward to... Um, following your podcast too, Josh, and, uh, um, you know, and just, um, you know, having a, having a, I don't know what's good, what we're going to call it, but I think we're, we don't even know what we're going to call what comes next, but I don't, it's not going to be the same environmental movement. That is for sure. And I'm really excited to be along for the ride and thanks, uh, Jeff for coming on the podcast. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks, Josh. And I'm going to go out and uh, say hello, hello to my birds and, uh, you know, nature. So well, thank you, you. You enjoy. Take care. Bye.